A new report from the UK states there is a realistic possibility the new COVID variant has a higher death rate than others. UK Prime Minister Boris, Boris Johnson said while the data is not conclusive, there is some evidence the new variant may be associated with a higher degree of mortality. Dr. Jonathan Cantor, an epidemiologist with the Penn Center for Epidemiology, joins me here on The Morning Show. So CDC modeling suggests this new variant, which has been shown to spread especially quickly, could become the predominant variant in the United States by March. And last numbers I saw show 195 cases in the U.S., 50 plus here in Florida. Data is mounting. It is more virulent. And then we heard this morning there's a case that showed up in Minnesota from Brazil. Worrying? Well, absolutely. I mean, I think part of the concern that we're seeing here is that we've had an increase uh, in these numbers of cases. Uh, you know, the other thing to keep in mind, of course, is that when you see numbers like 195 or 50 cases, you know, these are just samples. So this is a representative sampling that they're doing. This is not really showing everything that's out there. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, as we project, because the cases are more likely to spread with the variant, those numbers are going to increase and increase over time. So absolutely, as we're seeing these variants increase, you know, this is something that always happens with viruses, but absolutely it just highlights the need for social distancing for vaccines when it's available to you and all those other things that we've been talking about for so long. So people want to know if the current vaccine is going to be effective in fighting these new strains. Yeah, everything we know up to now suggests that the current vaccine will be effective in fighting the new strains. Keep in mind, you know, these are not, you know, different viruses. Uh, you know, viruses are always mutating. So every virus mutates. None of these mutations have suggested that they are going to be resistant to the virus. And that's really, really very important and very great news. So everything we know right now suggests that the vaccine is going to be protective uh, against these variants. And COVID infection in children is on the rise. And a lot of problems are presenting down the road, especially multi-system inflammatory syndrome. And I'm hearing there may be another surge on the way. Yeah, you know, it's very concerning. The thing, you know, to keep in mind is that there's been this up and down level of concern with kids, right? Initially, people said, you know, they poo-pooed the idea that, you know, the kids were, you know, a major concern. Then concern was raised about kids kind of being vectors of spread. Uh, you know, then some articles came out right before school uh, started uh, that suggested that, you know, kids may not be that responsible for, for spreading COVID. So I think the data is very much in flux right now. Uh, it's what is important to understand and is important to appreciate, as we've seen here in Northeast Florida, so sadly, is that kids can get, uh, you know, serious problems from the virus, both from the virus itself, as well as from those inflammatory responses that they can get to the virus. And so it's important to keep in mind that we shouldn't just discard the importance of kids getting infected, not only in terms of vectors for spreading to adults and the older population, but also in terms of what can happen to them. All right, you talked about kids as vectors of spread because there's a new epidemiological study from the University of Florida. It found that kids can be nearly 60% more likely than adults over 60 to infect exposed family members. And this is an issue because a lot of the kids are asymptomatic and parents may not even know that they're positive. Yeah, it's a super, super important issue to keep in mind. Uh, you know, the other thing to keep in mind is the big elephant in the room is there's no vaccine out there for kids right now. And it's not anywhere near us on the horizon. So it's not just that it, the kids are going to be last in line. It's that those clinical trials in kids, uh, some of them are just getting started and they're having trouble recruiting. So it's going to be very slow. It's going to take a very long time for us to get a viable vaccine that's going to work in kids. And, you know, the data have been mixed, as I mentioned. You know, you're right. This, you know, the UF study now is suggesting that kids can be strong vectors. There was data out of Switzerland, for example, beforehand that suggested that kids wouldn't be very good at spreading it. So I don't know if what we're seeing here is just a mix of, you know, different variants of the virus or what we're seeing here is really just the evolution of, uh, you know, as we're seeing what we're kind of seeing live, what happens in the process of science as we learn more and more, unfortunately, and we realize that, you know, there's nothing magical about children that would make them not be able to spread it. So it does certainly make sense that kids might not get as sick. But, you know, if kids have millions of virus particles and they are sneezing them out or coughing them out or just touching things, then it would be magical thinking to imagine that those are not going to infect adults. And yesterday, Dr. Fauci said maybe we should wear two masks. What did you think about that? Hey, you know, the whole mask thing, of course, has been, you know, very dramatic back and forth on the mask issue. Uh, you know, I think it's important to stress that the initial 
pushback against wearing masks uh, was largely to conserve masks. Uh, I think that's number one. It's very important to always, you know, clarify that. Uh, you know, the issue here is that, you know, the cloth masks that people are wearing uh, on a day to day basis that we're even seeing, you know, like the president, for example, wearing, uh, you know, those were put forward as a stopgap measure. You know, no one ever said that, you know, doctors should start wearing those in the operating room instead of standard surgical masks and that people should doctors should start wearing those instead of N95s if they're available, if you're taking care of patients with respiratory diseases. So, you know, it would be much better, I think, if everybody were wearing an N95 type mask, uh, that would be much better. And so as we approach that with, uh, you know, wearing double masks with increasing the amount of coverage people are getting, I think it only makes sense to think about that. You know, that said, you've got to also balance the suggestions to, uh, you know, increase the number of masks you're wearing with the pushback that you're going to get that we've already seen from the population. And one of the reasons cloth masks have been so successful is because they're easy. It's easy to find them. It's easy to buy them. They're washable. You can reuse them. And so we want to make sure that we make it as easy as possible for the public to do what they need to do to provide at least some measure of protection, both for themselves and for the community at large. Dr. Kenner, thank you.